Welcome to the Sydney International Guest Speakers Meeting held on the 11th of April 2021. Emotional sobriety begins when one adult child talks with another adult child sharing his or her experience, strength and hope. Today, we have the pleasure and honour to hear Lewis B from Florida come and share his experience, strength and hope, as well as on the topic of spirituality in ACA. Would you please all join with me in welcoming Lewis. Over to you, brother. Thanks, George. Uh, it's great to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken a few times, but every time I do it, I, uh, I still get nervous. And uh, I know sometimes if I just put that out there, my inner kids settle down a little bit. So just to acknowledge that, that's, that's still there, still a part of, part of doing this. Um, and yeah, I've shared my story before. Um, this is sort of unique for me in, in sharing a story and framing it around a topic, and that topic being spiritual inclusion or spirituality. Um, I realize that this can be a tough topic for a lot of people, and it can be a contentious topic for a lot of people. Um, my hope is to try to come from a place both from my head and my heart on this. Um, I think uh, it's a topic that requires both. Um, so I can say just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been ACA, um, just came up on my seventh year. And, um, um, and it's been quite a journey, quite honestly. Uh, I've come a long way and um, a lot of changes. I've, um, as I got a little bit further into the program, I did start to uh, come into doing service work um, and I incrementally did it. I, I think I did a pretty good job. I have a tendency to be the, uh, the hero child. I was the first born. And so I have a tendency to go in and take over and jump right in and use that as a mode of dissociation. But I, I got into service pretty slowly. I, you know, sort of typical thing. I would chair a meeting and secretary and, and then I got connected with WSO, World Service Organization. And um, I've sort of had two areas of focus with my service, uh, two primary areas, um, aside from spirituality. One is working with beginners, people who are new to the program. And I've been part of a team that developed um, a resource. It's a resource and development. Some of you may have heard of, but a New Hope uh, ACA Beginners Meeting Handbook. We have meetings for that. So I was a lead writer on that and a project manager. And so I've been involved in that. So focus on beginners and recognizing that um, um, the way that we learn to connect and rebuild a sense of trust um, varies in what's going to work for different people. For some people, sponsorship model works. For other people, different things work. So to try to find ways that we can um, create a softer landing for people coming into ACA. And that's been a passion of mine. Um, the other piece has been around reparenting. And, you know, we hear... Uh, with the solution, the solution is to become our own loving parent. And that's been very true for me. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fully participatory in the ACA work. I've done the Yellow Step Workbook three times. I've been part of step work groups is how I've done it. Uh, groups like four to eight people meet once a week, uh, about for a year at a time. And so going through that process. And I really see that step work as sort of um, heavy duty denial busting uh, in a lot of ways. Um, reparenting to me is where I've had a lot of the, the deepest, longest term recovery. And so um, some of my recovery work, uh, my service work is focused on that topic too. So um, I've been somewhat peripherally involved, uh, involved with uh, the Loving Parent Guidebook that's coming out. And I'm very excited for this new resource in our program. And that should be coming out in the next few months. And then there's another project, a writing project called Getting Started, which is in a sense, um, trying to come up with a shorter, friendlier version of the Big Red Book, again, oriented towards beginners, and I've been a lead writer on the reparenting chapters for that. So, so those are my two areas of focus, but um, another passion area for me has been around spirituality in ACA. And um, I've also been um, facilitating a working group. Uh, I was asked by Charlie, uh, who's been the head of the literature committee to 
come up with a working group to see if there's ways that maybe we can start taking a look at our literature and see if ACA could be more spiritually inclusive. And that was about the extent of the direction that I got. Uh, so it wasn't a whole lot to go on, but the idea being that, um, that it seems as though uh, a, quite a few people come to the program and feel a barrier um, on this topic with our program. And so um, examining what we might take a look at in our literature to see if there's ways that we can um, create, a, like we do with the beginners, a softer landing, something that uh, feels and works better for people. So, and there's at least one other person from that working group here, so I'm happy to see that also. Um, so um, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to go in the direction I'm going to go. So I have not spoken on this particular topic, and so I'm going to share a bit about my own story, but I want to create a little bit of a framework for it too. And I haven't shared specifically on this topic before uh, like this. And um, so this is a little bit uncharted territory for me, but I just wanted to pull out a few things and to sort of recognize there's a chapter in the Big Red Book, chapter five, and it says that ACA is a spiritual, not a religious program. And it's a very, very short chapter. Um, but within that chapter and within our literature generally, um, what we could say is that there's quite a bit of paradox if we don't want to use the word contradiction uh, or things of that nature. Um, so I'm going to do a screen share and I just put together a few notes. It's on a Word document. It's not like a major presentation. But I thought just as a little starting place. Um, and again, um, going to the head for me on this topic uh, experientially oftentimes uh, leads to a place, I think, of greater separation. And so I, I'd much prefer to go on the heart, but I do want to include some of the the actual um, pieces of, of what's included in our writing. So Big Red Book, Chapter 5, uh, ACA is a spiritual, not religious program. And I've read this chapter many, many times and looked at this topic and the rest of the uh, Big Red Book and other fellowship writing a number of times. So um, I just pulled out a few pieces that stood out to me. So um, I'm looking at the 14th printing. So I just put Big Red Book 14. Um, but it's, you know, this chapter is four to five pages long. So it says any solution for the disease of family dysfunction must include spirituality. So our program says uh, th that spirituality is required uh, as a part of this program. It also says any ACA member avoiding a spiritual path tends to struggle with making progress in ACA. Uh, it's been my experience, I think, in, in seeing the people around me that most people tend to <laughs> struggle with making progress in ACA at various times. It's a very tough program. Um, and so the, I think struggling with the spiritual path to me doesn't stand out alone as an area of struggle, but um, there's quite a few areas of struggle that people have, um, you know, with connecting into the fact of growing up in family dysfunction, many layers of denial, but also things that may or may not resonate. Um, ACA says, so this is uh, page 79, in ACA, we honor the sovereign right of every member to believe or not believe as he or she wishes. The atheist, agnostic are welcome in ACA as well. At the same time, ACA makes no apology in stating that spirituality must be sought to fully recover from the effects of disease of family dysfunction. So again, it's stressing the importance of spirituality. Um, and I, I guess I'll just say here, what, what I see somewhat absent in the writing is it talks maybe, and we'll get into this, what spirituality isn't, but it doesn't talk a lot about what spirituality is. Um, but it, it definitely stresses that it has to be there, right? It's a requirement. So um, there's actually, the, even though the chapter is called ACA is a spiritual, not a religious program, um, they really don't give many examples of why that is. And there's a few here that I pulled out. So ACA, we are spiritual, not religious, because we don't firmly believe that family, family dysfunction is a moral deficiency. That's what this, the big red book says. So um, I guess conversely, if we believed dysfunction is a moral deficiency, I guess we would be religious. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, um, but that's what the big red book says. Um, it says we are spiritual, not religious, because uh, I think it's we don't. We don't take issue with religions of the world. So again, sort of if you look at the converse, I guess if we did take issues with religions around the world, we would be religious. I don't know. So it's again, a little paradoxical, a little, a little confusing. Um, and it says here, religious systems outline specific rules of worship, salvation, historical religious figures, religious observance. We have no pulpit, hymnals, or Sabbaths. And so I guess based on this, we are spiritual and not religious. So um, again, this is, this is sort of the crux of what it's putting out there to say, this is why we are spiritual and not religious. And to me, from my perspective, it's just not a whole lot to go on. So 
you know, what we're talking about today, or my, the perspective I'm coming from is the idea of spiritual inclusion. And what I see is, um, come to understand maybe a couple of different ways that we could look at the, the idea of inclusion or how we how we approach this. Um, so there's a line in here, I think this comes from the AA preamble actually, but ACA is not aligned with any sect or denomination. These are words that I, I definitely associate with Christianity and sort of I went up and looked at Miriam Webster. Sect is a religious domination, denomination. A denomination is a religious organization whose congregations are united in adherence. So um, to me, this is saying uh, it doesn't matter if you're Methodist, it doesn't matter if you're Protestant, it doesn't matter if you're Lutheran, Baptist, you are welcome here. So no matter what Christian you are, you are welcome in ACA. And so to me, I see something like this, and it talks about maybe Christian inclusion, but I'm not sure it, it gets the heart of spiritual inclusion. Um, another area we can look at. So uh, the God as we understand God type language in ACA step three. Um, so here, God is capitalized. So uh, this sort of implies that the God we're talking about is not a God as though a noun. We're talking about a specific deity, uh, God being capitalized as a deity. So um, inclusion is based on a belief of a deity and that it's singular. God is always used in singular form. So it's, it's uh, based on a belief in a single deity. Um, so I think a, a major question that comes up for me is when we're talking about spirituality in ACA, are we saying that um, does ACA spirituality require belief in a deity? I think that's a question. And I think that um, in different places in our writing, it, to me, it seems like it does. In other places, maybe it doesn't. But I think that's a big question for our program. Um, does ACA spirituality, in the way that we're understanding it, require belief in a deity? Um, and so I'm, I'm calling this monotheistic inclusion. So if you believe in a deity and you're in ACA, you're good to go. But what if you don't? So that's a question. Um, and other language like this. So at first glance, ACA might look like a religious program since our literature includes the words God in prayer. And so uh, I've sort of come to understand this basically kind of, if this language doesn't work for you, then just either ignore it or do some sort of translation that works for you. And we see the sort of G-O-D is good orderly direction, that sort of thing. So this is the language that we use. And this is, this is what we're using. You're welcome to be here, but you're gonna to need to translate it in a way that works for you to, uh, to make this work. And there's this in, in, our, um, in uh, the work group that we have, we talk about the wink, wink, nod, nod sort of thing. So it's sort of said this, but the implication is that this is the language that we use. Eventually you'll come around and come to embrace this, come to believe this in the way that the rest of us do. And there's, uh, there's sort of a conditional quality for a lot of people that come in. It was that way for me. There was a conditional quality. It says, you know, you can do whatever you want. You're free to make the choices that you want to make. Um, but ultimately, you're going to eventually, hopefully, come around to this way of seeing things the way that most of us do. And, and so, again, in, this, um, in the work group, we're taking a look at a number of these things um, and just sort of trying to understand it a little bit more and recognize that, you know, people see spirituality in very different ways. So then the question comes up, what is spiritual inclusion? So to me, I don't feel as though our literature really speaks to what spiritual inclusion is. What does it mean to actually be spiritual? And so I'm going to stop the share here and come back to looking at some stuff. Um, and that's kind of where I want to dive off into sharing a little bit about me, because I consider myself to be a very spiritual person. Uh, I feel like I have been a spiritual person all of my life, as long as I can remember. As a, as a child, I feel like I was a very spiritual person. Um, I was also raised very religiously um, in a number of different ways. So I'm 51. I was born in 1970. Uh, my dad comes from uh, New York City. He was raised in Long Island in New York. It's in the Northeast U.S. And uh, he was raised Jewish. So that side of my family is Jewish. And so we have uh, a New York City Jewish family on that side of my family. And then my mom's side of the family uh, are Lutherans and they were homesteaders. So back in the origins when uh, the United States was being settled by non-Indigenous people, settled uh, being a, the word that's often used, but um, so they were homesteaders. And my mom's side of the family, this is sort of in the mountain Midwest, uh, sort of middle of nowhere type place. There were Lutheran farmers and that's where my mom came from. So in a sense, I was really born of two very different worlds, very, very different worlds. And um, both of my parents are adult children. 
both of them experienced uh, dysfunction in their, in their upbringing in different ways. Um, one thing that was very clear was both of my parents wanted to escape the lives that they were brought up in, right? And so it makes sense that they both kind of ran to something that was opposite than what they were, were brought up with. My mom wanted to get off the farm. She, did, she was supposedly raised to be a farmer's wife. And that's kind of what you do. You stay there and you take care of your man and that sort of thing. And she's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to do that. And my dad was supposed to marry a European woman and sort of sophisticated and well-educated and privileged. And he's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to do that. So they were both going to NYU and New York University for the graduate studies they met there. And uh, they both went to Peru. My dad went into the Peace Corps. It's a U.S. program. Uh, where people go around the world and give service. My dad did that and my mom followed him. They ended up getting married. And I was I was actually conceived in Peru. Um, but yeah, they came back eventually to New York. I was born in New York City in 1970. And um, I am the oldest of three. I have a, a younger sister in the middle and a younger brother. And we're all born within four years of, of each other. And so uh, we lived in New York for a while, so we were around my dad's family. And so there was a lot of uh, other family around uh, helping to take care of us. Um, so um, aunts, grandma, and I was a very precious child. I was sort of, there's a silver spoon uh, way of talking about things. And I was given that silver spoon and I was, I was the prize. I was, you know, the firstborn son and all of that. And, and that's what I was raised in. I was doted upon. Um, and uh, so I, I was initially raised in that. So regardless of how much immediate dysfunction there were in my parents, I had sort of some outside influences that I think helped buffer me. Um, but my, my dad, even though he was Jewish, we were not raised religiously Jewish at that point. His family was not religiously Jewish. So, but what ended up happening was uh, both my parents graduated and we ended up moving to the middle of the country in the U.S., right? It's basically equidistant between New York on the East Coast and Kansas in the Midwest. So both of them got as far away from their families as they could. And we sort of ended up in Chicago, right in the middle. That's, that's where I had a lot of growing up period. And at that point, uh, it's very clear to me in, in the ACA work that I did, uh, that my parents were very much on their own, very much overwhelmed, and things went really bad, really fast. And uh, my mom's an alcoholic. Uh, she uh, was a binge drinker. And, um, you know, while I don't have a lot of immediate memories at ages three, four, or five, um, I've, uh, my dad has shared some of the stories with me and they're not good stories. Um, and so my dad was very much, uh, became very much emotionally absent, very much a workaholic. Uh, my mom was also professional. She was a therapist trying to start her own private practice. Uh, but both of them were very much caught in their own wounding at that point. I think that's when uh, their ACA issues really came. And I was the oldest son. And I know at that point I became very parentified and I took on the role of being the, the oldest boy to look out for my brother, my sister. And I know at that point I learned to tune into my parents because they weren't able to tune into me. And that was how I was able to find connection. If I could tune into the woundedness of my parents, that's how I would get the attention. And I learned to be the best little boy in the world. And it was around that time that um, we started becoming more religious. And so we started going to temple, uh, synagogue in Judaism. And that's on a Friday night. So we would do that. We would go to all the high holiday celebrations. Uh, as I got a little bit older, I would go to Hebrew school on Sundays, Hebrew school on Tuesdays, Sunday school on Sundays. We would go to temple Friday nights. We would do prayers at dinner. It was a very sort of religious environment. And that's what I was raised with. My mom converted to Judaism. And so uh, we were raised Jewish. At the same time, we did spend time, especially on the summers, we would go to the farm, right? My mom's side of the family and they were religiously Christian. So we would go to church every Sunday. We would read the Bible at breakfast and it was a very religious environment there too. So in a sense, I was raised uh, religiously in two different religions in that sense. Um, as things were happening, my mom continued to drink and my mom ended up finding AA and my dad Al-Anon around the same time when I was about eight years old. So it was about 1978. And so they both entered 12-step programs. And in a sense, um, the 12-step framework became another framework of growing up and the spirituality, religiosity of 12-step programs became another framework for my, program, for my family. Um, and so... Uh, even though my family was, um, my, my parents were in recovery, there was still a lot of dysfunction happening. And so what happened at that point was the language of 12-step programs, higher powers and stuff, in a sense was weaponized uh, in my childhood. 
And so they would take the language from the program and then that would get translated into the dysfunction of my family. And so when I later on, which I'll talk about, uh, entered into, was looking for help in 12 step programs, that was a huge obstacle for me. It was very tough. It was very triggering. Um, so a few examples, um, and, and a lot of these are common, it's not just 12 step programs, but God helps those who help themselves. So uh, the idea, these are, and I sort of see these as the reinforcements of don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. So uh, God helps those who help themselves basically was sort of like, leave me alone, go figure it out. Like, don't bring your feelings to me. Don't bring your needs to me. I'm overwhelmed. God helps those who help themselves. Right. Or my dad would be overwhelmed and it was let go and let God. Well, just, you know, we don't know what's happening. Just let go and let God it was again, is sort of like, go figure it out on your own. Um, there was also um, some of the anti-victim language that can happen in, um, in the addictions recovery circles for sure. And so um, as a kid, I was often told, stop playing a victim. If I would sort of, if I was crying, if I started, if I brought needs, if I had feelings, if I had vulnerability, I was playing victim, right? So stop playing victim. Um, this isn't a pity party, you know, get off the pity pot. Um, and so some of these, again, this is sort of in the circles of, of some 12 step programs, these, these became a part of my upbringing. And, and in a sense, it was sort of a, a part of the mechanism of the shaming and abandonment that I experienced. So um, it set the tone for, for some difficulties for me. Another one was the concept of detaching with love. Um, I, I definitely know that I, I've been involved in some AA and Al-Anon. So I, I know that Al-Anon is big on that one. My dad was Al-Anon. He used that a lot. And so in regards of, you know, how you interact uh, with a, a spouse, my mom, who is lost in addictions, the idea is to detach with love, right? To learn to set some boundaries with that. But he would use that with us, his kids. You know, if he got overwhelmed, I just need to detach with love right now, right? And then he's out of here. So a lot of these sort of terms that I use, the phrases, slogans, and stuff like that were um, really uncomfortable for me. Um, and at that time too, my dad in particular really embraced the idea of a higher power. And so um, he would often to refer to HP as sort of best buddy HP, higher power. And, and so um, there was a, a, an air of religiosity that came about it. Before that point, um, you know, we would go to temple and stuff. And I had a sense while that was going on, while we were doing all of this religiosity, that behind the scenes, you know, we would, we would go to the temple, we would look like the ideal family, but behind the scenes, it was just a messy stuff going on, right? So in a sense, I felt like the religion was a sense of betrayal to me. Like, this is the false facade, right? This is the betrayal of, of everyone seeing, looking as though everything's okay, but really behind the scenes, it's not. And so it took on that air uh, for me. I also remember um, when I was, I don't know, eight to 10 years old, uh, again, uh, sort of a spiritual kid, um, I remember sitting in temple and I came up with that. I made a deal with God at that time. My, my understanding of God from a, you know, eight to 10 year old Jewish kid. And I remember distinctly making a deal that said, if I am the best little boy in the world, everything is going to be okay. Right. My part is to be the best little boy in the world. And then everything will be okay. And so I did very clearly I did that and I did everything I could to be the hero child and I know that sort of connects into the idea of trying to save our families trying to save our parents um, but I remember making that deal I remember sitting in temple and that was a very clear thing for me um, what I can say is eventually uh, later on my, you know things continued we ended up moving a lot but my parents got divorced when I was 15 and I remember feeling a sense of betrayal around that promise like I did my part what happened you know, did I not try hard enough? Or not? So I had some sense of failure, but I also had a, a lot of anger around that, that everything wasn't okay. My family was not okay. My dad was gone. My mom was very sick and I felt completely overwhelmed. The other piece for me was that um, at that time, it was very clear to me, I was attracted to other guys. So I'm gay. And um, that was a challenge I felt very alone with. And I didn't know what was going on with that either. I didn't know what to make of that in my spiritual framework because this was 1983 in sort of Midwestern US during the explosion of the AIDS epidemic in the United States. And all I knew was this was a very bad thing and I must be a very bad boy, but I'm trying to be the best little boy in the world. And it was such a conflict for me, right? So I just hit it, I stuffed it and I dated cheerleaders and I played football, American football and did all the things to make sure that no one was ever gonna guess that about me. And so in a sense, I went into that closet, but I realized too, that it was a closet built on another closet. And the first closet being the closet of don't talk, don't trust, don't feel in my family of origin. 
those family rules of dysfunction were the first closet where I had to disconnect from the truth of who I was. And then when I discovered my sexuality, it was just a further disconnection. I'd already been trained how to be closeted and I just continued it. And so, you know, I, I was the best little boy in the world. At the same time, I found alcohol at age 16, I'm sorry, age 14. And so I, I drank and that's how I bonded with my friends, right? My friends drank, I drank, I was cool. And wow, it really took the edge off of that social anxiety too, right? And um, that's what I found. That's what I did. So it was achievement, you know, get as best grades as possible, be a star athlete, and then just disconnect, dissociate through alcohol. And that's what I did. And I did it and I did it. And uh, I went up through college and about age 20, I started having just very intense panic attacks. And uh, these were sort of the psychologically scary panic attacks. So they, some people have heart palpitations. I can't breathe. For me, it was a very psychologically uh, scary experience. And I didn't really know what was going on at the time. Uh, I was put on benzodiazepine tranquilizers and I was put on antidepressants and I got on all that stuff and I was I quit drinking for a little bit, but I, I picked that up again later. And that's what I did. And, and I started seeing a psychiatrist and did some therapy. And my sense was, you know, he, he and he wanted to talk about my sexuality. And I was like, I don't want to talk about that. That's scary. That's, but I eventually did. And it became very clear to me. I was like, I'm not living in my truth. And as I eventually came out at around age 21, uh, and began to live my truth, my anxiety started to decrease a bit at that time. And it became clear to me at some level that for me, anxiety was stuffing the truth of who I am. That's, that's the correlation for me. I tried to get off the medications that I was on several times, but I just, I couldn't do it. I kept drinking and, and I stayed on those medications for a very, very long time. So, um, uh, I'm going to jump a little bit around, but uh, basically, I just sort of went through life the best I could with grabbing a crutch here or there. I would fall off the horse. I tried to keep my energy level at a very high. We talk about addiction to excitement is one of the traits. Keep the energy level up. Keep the achievement going. Stay on the proverbial horse. Keep riding the bike, whatever you want to say, whatever metaphor. And I would fall at times, right? I would get discouraged. I would fall off. I would get, you know, something wouldn't work with a job or things like that. But I would always find a way to sort of get back up on the horse. And that's what I did. Uh, my first degree, I did graduate from college uh, with honors. My first degree was in psychology. And at first I did work with gay and lesbian youth and it was rewarding for me. But I also looking back realized that I ran into my childhood wounding with that. And I got very much overwhelmed. And again, this is the nineties uh, in the US at least, it was a very contentious period and a very dangerous period in a lot of ways. And so my coming out was very big, um, but I put myself out there and the way that I did was I just, again, I had learned to shut off my fear as a kid. So I just shut off my fear and I just charged forward. I'd speak in audiences of 400 people. I'd do these things and I just, I was dissociated. I was checked out and that's how I did it. So, um, but I had to walk away from that. I did go back to school. Um, I ended up starting my own business. It was a dot-com era, right? And at least in the US, it was late nineties. Uh, before the dot-com bus and I just kind of got on that. I did graphic design, multimedia development. I ended up starting my own internet-based company and it was in the tattoo industry. It was kind of a cool industry and I did that for a while. Um, I did that for about 20 years actually and um, got to a point where I uh, came to my ACA bottom and this was about seven or eight years ago. Maybe nine is when it started and I, I had been dating but I, I never um, in my relationships, I was always very much alone. I tended to date people who were younger than me that were looking for someone to take care of them. And I was basically playing the role of my dad in a lot of ways uh, in those relationships. But more than anything, I was very much emotionally shut down, emotionally shut off. I learned to do that because being close to people scared me, quite honestly. And uh, it was too raw for me. It was too scary. So um, in when I was around uh, late 30s or so, uh, late 30s or 40s, um, I got into a relationship and I decided this is this is this is the guy, this is the one, and it did not work out that way. And there was sort of a culmination of events. This was the first time really that I had been dumped in the relationship where I really experienced my abandonment wounds. Um, I was kind of been the dumper, right? But this is the one where I was sort of the one that was left behind in in that situation. So that was going on. Uh, I had a relationship that I thought was going to be the one that wasn't the one. 
uh, I was had a company and the company, the dot com stuff was falling apart. Google had sort of taken over some areas in our business and it just was not working. Things were falling apart. I had a very contentious relationship with a business partner I brought in and that was falling apart. And then my sister, who I was close with, who lived near me, got very sick. And uh, looking back, it was a lot of her trauma stuff coming up and she had uh, major disabilities going on and uh, she ended up moving in with me and my life crashed. And uh, I just knew I was done. I knew that I just couldn't keep living like that anymore. I couldn't keep on, I couldn't get back up on the horse. There wasn't a horse to get back up on at that point. So um, I knew uh, that I needed to quit drinking. And I felt strongly I needed to get off of those medications, those tranquilizers, antidepressants. I felt like I'd been on them for a very long time and I felt like they weren't serving me in the way that they were. And I needed to get off of that. Um, and I needed to make some big changes in my life. And so I did quit drinking and I tried AA uh, and let's circle back to the religion, spirituality type stuff. And here I was, I was in a place and I was desperate and I knew I needed to quit drinking. And I knew probably what most people do is you go to AA and I went there and I wanted to run screaming when I went into those rooms. And it just felt, it felt like my family. It felt like my dysfunctional family. And more than anything, the talk around God, uh, specifically that word, but the talk around God was very difficult for me. Um, in ACA, I, I, I came to understand, and this has been very important work, that the ties around my family, as a, as a kid, I, came, I, I, learned the, I learned attachment. I learned attachment in ACA and what that, was, what, what that was about. That as a kid, I was born as a small child, I was born into this world, small, needy, helpless, and dependent, and my parents were my gods, right? I was completely dependent on them for my survival, for everything, for clothing, for nurturing. And I was dependent on, they were my universe. They were my, my gods. And so I love in our program, when we do this work, we draw that connection. And I, I was very able to see the dysfunction of my, my parents is what I projected onto my understanding of how the universe works or a deity, that sort of thing. So that was very deep work for me, but I was not at that point when I first came into the program. And so I was lucky to find a, they call it free thinkers in AA. That is what I did. And it was sort of a more secular approach to that program. And I'm grateful that that existed. I'm grateful that that was there because it was different enough. It allowed me a little bit of breathing room to be able to do the work that I needed to do um, and not run screaming from the rooms. Right. Um, I tried a little bit of Al-Anon at that point, but that reminded me completely of my dad. Right. I, I was like, I had to get out of here. This is my dad. It's my mom. <clears throat> And through Al-Anon, they have sort of an adult child little piece of their program. I, I learned about ACA, and that's when I found ACA. And I was living in uh, Colorado in the United States at that point. And just checking my time. Um, so I found ACA, and that's really when I went into recovery. So where a lot of people spend quite a bit of time in other addictions, recovery, 12-step programs, um, focus on maybe getting sober with alcohol or focus on their food issues or whatever it is, their addictions recovery. Um, I kind of jumped right into ACA very early on and I was able to do my addictions recovery and my trauma recovery work in ACA. So that's a little bit different. Uh, not everyone does it that way, but that's what worked for me. And within ACA, I felt there was enough of a difference specifically around the language that I think it was because of the trauma element and the inner child there was a softer quality to it that, that created enough space for me that, that it could work. Um, I didn't realize until later our um, strengthening our recovery, the daily devotional reader that we have, I, I would read that and I'm like, why is this, this feels so much different than all the other programs, like Elena, it feels so much different than the other daily readers. And I didn't quite put it together later that they use the word higher power instead of God. And it made a huge difference for me not to have the words that were so triggering. So, you know, when they quote the big red book, they'll use the word, but really there's focus on higher power and it had a more of a general quality. It created a little bit more space for me to work with. Um, but I'll tell you what, that yellow workbook <laughs> and those steps two and three, they were brutal for me, you know, and I just really struggled with it. And um, what I had to do was I had to, uh, with that going back to the um, slogan, let go and let God, I had to let go and not know. That's ultimately what I had to do. I had to let go. I had to surrender and I had to let go and just not know. And it wasn't about having a safety net. It wasn't about having a softer landing. It wasn't about finding a belief in something that was going to uh, be what we ACA oftentimes calls our actual parent. That was not a framework that was going to work for me. It just wasn't. So I let go and for, and not know. And that's what I did. So um, 
I was able to move forward and it was okay. I mean, it was uncomfortable, but that was my path. And so I was able to get to step four and I was able to do those sheets and I was able to do the recovery work that helped me come out of denial in such powerful ways. And uh, I didn't let it be a stumbling block for me. I just kept moving forward. That's what I did. And within ACA, I felt like I had enough freedom to do that. But I'll tell you what, not everyone feels that way uh, when they come into our program. Not everyone, uh, for whatever reason, not everyone can, can navigate that way. And so it breaks my heart. It literally breaks my heart when people come into this program and they're like, there's some language here and some ways of looking at things that just don't work for me. They just don't work. And it breaks my heart because for me, there's things that our program says are required that for me weren't required. I was able to find a way, a different way. Um, I see your prompt, uh, George, thank you. So, um, <sighs> So I don't want to take something from someone that they cherish and tell them they can't use that. That's not my goal. My goal is to create more space, to create, thing, to create space for people to find things that work for them. That's my goal. And I know this is going to be a very slow process, right? It's going to be a slow process. That's how these things work. And it shouldn't be any other way than that. We learn to take baby steps in ACA. And I think as a program, we take baby steps, right? That's what we do. So at the same time, um, as, as we move forward and as I've been involved in this spiritual inclusion working group, um, just with that group, so the purpose is to, to create some sort of recommendation, right? And we're working on that. Who knows how long it's going to take? So I don't know what this recommendation is going to look like. But what I can say is with the knowledge that this group is, is happening and it's, and it's there, uh, I think there's a greater consciousness that's happening sort of in the, in, in the realms, right, of, of ACA literature and things of that nature. There's a greater consciousness around, is there a way that we can make this tent just a little bit bigger? Is there a way that we can make it so that there's a place for someone to walk in and feel like they, they belong here uh, who might ordinarily not? And so, you know, as the Loving Parent Guidebook came out, you know, that team consulted with us and they said, you know, maybe you could take a look at this and just see if, if you have any ideas about what we might do to make this a little bit more inclusive for people. And we did. We took a look at that. And so that's something that's reflected in the Loving Parent Guidebook that comes out. And then in the Beginner's Handbook, um, again, we sort of we said, is there a way that maybe we can back off on some of the terminology and make this a little bit a little bit broader? And I'm going to show you a little bit of an example of that. But we put a lot of emphasis in that to try to find ways to make this um, something that works better for more people. And make sure too that you know a lot of the perspective, the roots of AC, the roots of AA, the roots of twelve-step programs are very much you know Christian U.S. based. And so as ACA becomes a worldwide program, there's a lot of other perspectives that are involved here, right? A lot of different ways of seeing the world, and we want to make sure that that's reflected as best as possible. That's my goal anyway. So um, let me just take a look at here again. I'm kind of got about five minutes. So. Um, So I'm gonna do a little screen share here. And I'm gonna put this up. So here's a spiritual perspective. Uh, spirituality is an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us and it binds the galaxy together. Is there anyone that, that knows what spiritual tradition this is from or who, who it is that said this? Star Wars, Yoda. Star Wars, and it was actually Obi-Wan Kenobi, but very good Omid. Very good. So this is the best, most resonating thing that I have found for my spirituality, right? There's nothing about a God in here, right? There's nothing about me believing in a deity. It just says there's something bigger than me, right? There's an energy field created by all living things. It represents connection. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, and it binds everything together, right? And so, you know, what I realized was I saw that movie at seven years old when I was just a little boy. And I know that something in this kept me going through the rest of my life when that dysfunction was there. And when I would say I'm a spiritual kid, I connected into this. And that became another spiritual framework for me. It was a movie, right? And I drew from that. And yes, it's representative of, you know, Buddhism and all kinds of, you know, Christian, there's all kinds of beautiful stuff in it, but it's very basic and it allowed me to connect into it in a very powerful way. 
And that's my hope. My hope is that we can continue in this program to find ways that we, of wording things, of presenting things that don't take anything away from someone, but create more hooks for people to, to, to latch into. That's my hope. So um, I'm going to close here shortly. What I want to share is something from the Beginner's Handbook. So Beginner's Handbook, uh, Beginner's Meeting Handbook that we're working on, uh, we're on, working on draft four. We're going to be submitting it to WSO uh, pretty soon. Uh, but there's a chapter on spirituality. And um, a lot of people, a lot of people have input on this. Um, so each chapter has about a page worth of writing and it has some questions. But this paragraph for me, it's the last paragraph in that chapter. And I just want to, I'd like to share it here. Um, so I'm going to read it here. But it's the last, last paragraph in that chapter. At its core, spirituality itself is a process of surrender. We, re we release the illusion that we must have all the answers. When we recognize that we need help and sincerely ask for it in our ACA community, we open to sources of love, healing, acceptance, and wisdom that we never knew existed. To our amazement, these resources become increasingly accessible and our world becomes bigger and kinder. Some of us explain this in secular terms, such as the power of friendship, community, and connection. Others more comfortably experience this in traditionally religious language. But whether atheist, agnostic, or believer, all recovering adult children have access to powers greater than themselves. In this sense, spirituality is something many of us feel when we sit among fellow travelers at an ACA meeting and experience within as we learn to become our own loving parents. And so to me, this is talking about what spirituality is. And to me, this is an example of what inclusive spirituality might look like. So we'll stop the screen share. I will thank you all for listening to me and being witness to me sharing my story. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a tough topic. It's a tough topic for me. And so I appreciate um, you all doing that. Um, George, I think you said you wanted to maybe do a little bit of question time. Do we have time for that? Uh, certainly. Uh, please join in uh, thanking Lewis for his uh, lovely talk and, and uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank, thank you so much, George. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. It was incredible. Thank you. Um, that's all the time we have for our recording uh, today. Uh, the full details of this recording and upcoming speakers can be found at acoasydney.com.au. Um, thank you, everyone.